on demand. Welcome to Bartol on Demand. The Bartol Foundation supports in-depth arts pro education and community-based arts programs in the city of Philadelphia. And as part of this work, they offer free professional development programs for teaching artists each year. You can learn more about Bartol at their website at bartol.org. On Demand is a new series of online programs being offered by Bartol to support the sharing of knowledge and resources within the local community and beyond. Our topic tonight is Sharing Creative Work and Knowledge, a new take on intellectual property. And it's being offered on demand as a topic we believe will be of interest to the wider community. My name, the person behind the screen here, is Christina Cantrell, and I work for the National Writing Project. I'm actually based here in Philadelphia and will be the moderator for tonight. I'm really excited to welcome our guests. Ken Metzer, an attorney and executive director of Kun Young Lin Dance in Philadelphia, and Jane Park, project manager for Creative Commons. Jane is based in LA. We are also doing a very special first time simulcast of this webinar via Educator Innovator, an initiative powered by my organization, the National Writing Project. Creative Commons is also a partner. Educator Innovator and its partners support learning opportunities for teachers, youth workers, mentors, librarians, ed museum educators, teaching artists, etc. that are open, remixable, and typically free or low cost. And all of these opportunities share the goal of a more powerful and connected learning uh, opportunities for youth. So you can learn more about Educator Innovator um, at educatorinnovator.org. Finally, if you are joining us tonight live. We encourage you to join us in the chat at the Bartol Foundation website and post questions and comments that we'll address during the chat, the second half of tonight's show. And we're really excited to talk together as artists and educators about issues of sharing creative work and knowledge across both maker spaces and informal and formal education. So we see this webinar tonight as a real learning opportunity for us all, and we encourage you to jump on in. The webinar will also be archived and available along with related resources at the Bartol Foundation and the Educator and Innovator websites. So let me get myself back here. Great. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, back in body form. And I'm really excited um, to kick this uh, webinar off tonight. And thanks for our guests for being here and for the Bartol Foundation in supporting uh, this webinar. Um, I thought I would take us back to an idea that drew us all together initially, and that I think is at the core of this conversation our shared interest in supporting youth and being makers and creators in the world. We know that. Uh, this kind of work supports learners in being active and creative, creative agents in their own learning and meaning making. And it's what we know at the Writing Project, you know, this kind of uh, making to learn is not just what we do as kids, it's actually how we learn in the world as adults too and as creators. Um, at the National Writing Project, we um, work um, in order to teach writing, we write ourselves as educators. So it's this creative practice and that we're really deeply committed to and the idea that creating is the at the heart of learning and therefore at the heart of teaching. So Ken, I wanted to turn to you first. Um, when we create in communities of others and use these creations to inspire or to provoke or to engage, um, we run into a range of issues about what does it mean to respectfully and legally share and use what we create and what others create. Um, these issues are provoked in our increasingly networked world, too, where we have this ease of publication, ease of distribution, ways to remix and ways to reuse that we never had before. Um, and then many of these core questions are actually kind of old as the hills. We've been negotiating these for <laughs> various ways over a very long time. Um, but a lot of us remain kind of confused, I would say, about them, and there are complex issues. So maybe you could kick us off with a view into intellectual property and help us demystify that a bit? Sure, it would be my pleasure. 
Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And to echo Christina's comments, we're um, very anxious to hear any questions that you might have. I thought um, we might begin the conversation with some of the popular intellectual property myths that are out there. This certainly will not be an exhaustive list, but um, maybe a good way to sort of um, get us going. So uh, the first myth that sometimes we hear is that there is no protection or recourse because they didn't copyright it. Or the variation being, someone's using my work, but I have no recourse because I didn't copyright it. The myth lies in the fact that copyrights are automatic. No notice is required. Once the work is created and it is reduced to a tangible form, meaning, meaning written or recorded, then copyright exists and the protection exists. Another myth. Well, the content was in an email or on Facebook, so it's in the public domain. I can use it. Just because something is widely circulated or casually circulated does not mean that it loses protection. It is not automatically in the public domain because we see it floating around. Number three, this work is so old, anyone can use it. Let's remember, copyrights last a very long time. For more recent works, meaning works that are created from 1978 and forward, the duration of a copyright is actually the entire length of the creator's life plus 70 years. For earlier works, the duration of the copyright will vary, but generally it will last anywhere from 95 to 120 years. So these rights last a very long time. Number four, this is one of my favorite myths. Well, nobody's going to find out if I use it. I don't think we need to belabor the point that we all live in this incredibly networked world. And using a work of someone else that is subject to copyright can end up on the internet, on YouTube, on Vimeo, uh, on any number of sites out there. And there are a lot of owners of copyrights and trademarks who are very vigilant in protecting their intellectual property. So they use a variety of monitoring services and you would be very surprised perhaps the first time that you are informed that using some music for example is not permitted and you are asked to take it down. Another myth. Well I made seven changes to the work um, so I'm good. Or I only used a little bit of it, so that can't possibly be a copyright violation. There is no magic formula. The test for copyright violation is substantial similarity, or for trademark, a likelihood of confusion with the owner of the mark. And so if you hear anyone offering a particular formula that they say will protect you from an infringement claim, they're just flat out wrong. Another myth. Well, I didn't charge for the work that I created, so there is no copyright violation. Let's remember, a copyright means, among other things, that the creator of the work has the exclusive right to determine how the work, when the work, and where the work is distributed. It's not a question of compensation. Number seven, I credited the author or the creator of the work, so there's no copyright violation. Well, that's another myth. Giving credit to the creator does not prevent a, an infringement claim because that creator may not want their work to be used in the way that you seek to use it, and they have that right as the creator to control how the work is distributed. Number eight. The concept of fair use protects me from liability. This one actually is not a complete myth. In my experience, people have a misunderstanding of the fair use defense to copyright infringement, but it does exist. Unfortunately, however, determining whether or not 
the use of protected works is fair use is a fact-intensive case-by-case analysis. There are a number of factors that a court will look at in determining whether or not the fair use defense applies. Those include the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work. For example, is it a work of fact, nonfiction, or fiction? What is the amount and substanti uh, sub substantiality of the portion of the copyrighted work that is used in relation to the whole? And finally, what is the effect of the use on the market or on the value of the work? As you might well imagine, this is a very difficult analysis, and it's not always easy to say when the fair use defense applies. Now, one tool that I have found very helpful and I'd like to share with you, and I think that we will be sharing that with you um, along with the archived video, is uh, what is known as a fair use checklist. This particular fair use checklist was uh, prepared by Kenneth Cruz from Columbia University and Dwayne Butler from the University of Louisville. And I'm offering it also today as an illustration of how to use a work via a license. In this case, uh, this particular checklist is available pursuant to a Creative Commons attribution only license. And pursuant to that license, I can share this checklist with you by giving credit to the checklist's original creators. And with that segue, I'd like to introduce Jane Park from Creative Commons. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Ken. Um, so I'm with Creative Commons. I'm going to give you some background on Creative Commons and how that works and how that interplays with the copyright system that Ken um, just laid out. So as we all know, copyright is automatic. You are granted that at the instant of creation, once you put something into a tangible medium, and it lasts a very long time, life of the author plus 70 years and 120 years for corporate works. Um, copyright was created before the internet was. So uh, there's this tension between copyright laws becoming more restrictive over time, whereas it's becoming a lot more easier to share digital works um, through the internet. And so because this tension exists, that's why Creative Commons was created. And I'm going to do a screen share now um, to show you some slides to explain CC. So now you can all see my slides. So this is pretty much how I like to explain Creative Commons. If the simplest way um, I like to tell someone on the street or you know another educator or an artist is that I like to say that Creative Commons makes sharing creativity, creative works, online, easy, legal, and scalable. And by creativity, I mean anything that you can copyright. So that includes things like photos, video, music, podcasts, books, scientific research, data, you name it, pretty much anything that you can create and record and put into a tangible medium is stuff that you can share with Creative Commons because it can also be copyrighted and Creative Commons is built upon copyright law. And the way that Creative Commons allows you to share these creative works is through simple, standardized, and legally robust copyright licenses that allow you, the creator, to grant copyright permissions to your creative works. So a common myth is that Creative Commons means you're giving away your copyright. That couldn't be further from the truth. With Creative Commons, you're keeping your copyright. You're merely allowing certain uses of your work to the public. You're granting copyright permissions in advance. So it's a standard way that you can grant copyright permissions while maintaining your copyright. So it's a more flexible way to manage your copyright online. Creative Commons fills the gap, the space between all rights reserved copyright, which Ken went over, and the other extreme, which is the public domain, which Ken also mentioned. So before Creative Commons existed, it was founded in 2001, there were only two options for creators. If you wanted to share your work, um, you could either you know, just put it out online or just on paper, and it would be automatically all rights reserved copyright, which means that you reserved all rights, and anyone who wanted to do anything with your work had to come and ask you expressly for permission. Or you could say that you 
or you could give up all rights to your work and put it in the public domain. Um, and that means that anyone can do anything with your work, but they don't have to give you credit um, or anything. And so only these two extremes existed. Obviously, there was a space for Creative Commons to fill because a lot of artists and teachers and creators today want to share their work under more flexible terms and conditions, but they still want to keep their copyright. So Creative Commons fills this space. And it does that through the copyright licenses, which I mentioned, which are made up of four basic elements. Once you have an understanding of these four elements, you pretty much have a pretty good understanding of how Creative Commons works. The um, one element that all the licenses have is attribution, and that's what we kind of all understand. It's all about giving credit to the creator of the work. So all of our licenses have the attribution condition, which require you to give credit to the creator or copyright owner. And then on top of that, you can choose to add conditions um, based on how you want to share your work. So if in addition to um, getting credit you want to prohibit commercial uses of your work, you would add the non-commercial condition. Um, if you wanted to prohibit people from making derivative copies of your work without your permission, and by derivative I mean translations, remixes, anything that merits um, creative enough material to become a derivative work, then you would add the no derivative works condition. Um, if you wanted to require people who did create derivative works off of your work to share their uh, version of that under the same exact terms that you um, put your work out under, so the same exact license, you would put it under the share alike condition. So these four elements mix and match um, into six possible legal combinations. So there are six copyright licenses, six Creative Commons licenses that you can choose from. And you can see that they're on a spectrum of the most open license, which is Creative Commons Attribution only, um, to the least open, which is Creative Commons Attribution plus a non-commercial plus a no derivative works condition. Basically, the most open license, which is CC BY, means that you can do anything with a work, including remix it, translate it, sell it, um, as long as you give credit to the original um, creator or the copyright owner. Um, on top of the six copyright licenses, you'll notice that we have a public de dedication, public domain dedication tool at the top, which is called CC0. And I do want to explain this one briefly. This is um, if you, as an owner or an institution, wants to give up all copyrights to your work. Before Creative Commons developed this legal tool, there was no actual way that people could say that my work is in the public domain. They could say my work is in the public domain, but that would not actually be legally viable around the world. And so we developed CC0 for people who might want to give up all copyrights to their work. So it might be hard for you as an individual creator to imagine why someone would want to do that, but if you imagine institutions that have a lot of data or scientific research, um, you can imagine that those institutions would want to put their work under into the public domain using CC0. And one concrete example of that is the recent um, initiative SpaceX, who is a contractor of NASA's, as we know, um, most U.S. government works, if they're created by the U.S. government, are automatically in the public domain. But because SpaceX is a contractor of NASA's, they aren't required to put their work in the public domain, but they have a lot of really high-quality images of space. Um, and because of public demand, they agreed to put their images of space into the public domain, and they did so using the CC0 public domain dedication tool. So those are our legal tools that we offer. Um, all of our legal tools are built for the internet age, which means that they are made up of, they are designed in three layers. So there's a base license at the bottom, which is called the legal code, and this is the actual legal license that lawyers have drafted and vetted around the, that, and would hold up in a court of law around the world. And then on top of that, there's a human readable summary of the legal license into language that you and I can understand. And on top of that, there's a machine readable layer, which is basically a fancy way of saying that um, this is a code that search engines like Google and Yahoo would read to detect that a work is under a CC license so that you can search for Creative Commons license images and photos and uh, videos on the internet. So this is a State of the Commons report um, we issued last year. We were founded in 2001. You can see that as of um, fall 2014, we estimate there to be around 882 million Creative Commons licensed works on the web. And they are works that are photos, scientific um, data, they are government works, they are um, films, they are all sorts of educational resources. Um, and um, the last time we checked, 
58% uh, of these millions of works allow commercial use, and 76% of them allow adaptations under the, under the Creative Commons licenses. The trend seems to be more and more towards creators and institutions allowing more liberal uses of their works if they choose to share under CC. Um, and one kind of neat kind of art exam uh, remix community project example I wanted to mention before handing it back over to Christina and so we can answer your questions is um, so this is one really interesting use of Creative Commons. This is a national gallery of Denmark and Copenhagen. So a lot of museums are now using Creative Commons tools to put out um, their cultural heritage collections under Creative Commons and the National Gallery of Denmark and Copenhagen has a lot of public domain artworks and they decided because these artworks, um, their copyright has expired um, such as sculptures and two-dimensional paintings they put out um, faithful reproductions, which means they took pictures of these artworks and they decided to put these um, pictures into the public domain using CC0. And because they did that, um, when there was uh, construction going on within Copenhagen around their subway system, um, the local artists and the local teaching community decided to um, partner up with the metro system and build a mural, um, a wall around the construction site because the construction site was an eyesore to the community and they decided to um, blow up the pictures of the public domain artworks and um, paint a big uh, mural all around the construction site. So that's kind of a neat use of how you can see Creative Commons aids um, art to be accessible to the community. Jane, can I ask you something? Sure. This um, image is um, sort of is fascinating and a little confusing to me. So we're the the scale of it, I think. But we're mm -hmm. looking at the wall that's being built around, right? And then they're putting the images that are freely available. They blew them up and are pasting them up. As is that what we're looking at? Yeah, and I think I think it's not just blowing it up. I think they may have actually painted some of it or yeah I think they're uh -huh. blowing it up and they actually like remixed it a little bit um, it. yeah interesting yeah so um yeah that's what's going on there and the photo itself was under CC by by whoever took that photo <laughs> Frida Gregerson yeah right 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 um cool great um so I'm sorry I cut in are you was that the end Jane or did you um, I actually have um, some other tools I can share, but why don't we, you know, stop for questions or do have it be more of a conversation because I don't want to keep on just talking. <laughs> okay. In case, uh, yeah. Um, and then we can go back to the tool, sort of like how you can make a license for your work, right? Yeah. Great. Well, Ken, your question was sort of related to that. So do you want to just even speak that question? Because I think a lot of people might be asking, thinking that themselves. Right. Um, thank you. Jane, I was wondering, could you explain if there is a fee charged to creators uh, to use a Creative Commons license or how that works? Yeah. Um, so Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization. We're funded by foundations. And the reason we develop these licenses is so that people can um, use them for free. And so, no, Creative Commons licenses are free for anyone and anyone around the world to use. They can use it. Um, it's basically a way for them to bypass the middleman. You don't have to hire a lawyer to write up your own license. You can use one of our pre-made licenses and just slap it onto your work. And that way, um, it's legally viable to whoever wants to use your work. Um, and I would say that um, it's... We've put a Creative Commons license on a website that I, well, on many of the websites that I work on, but um, Digital, is web, Digital Is is a website that I work on, and we put a Creative Commons license, and it was both uh, free to us, but then also the resources for thinking through which licenses we want, like how we wanted to do that was also uh, freely available. So it was an incredible resource actually, the Creative Commons website for us to be able to make that human and machine readable um, technology available to everybody. Jane, maybe it does make sense just given that question to just like show real quickly how the tool works since it segues naturally. Yeah, so, um, okay, so I'm sharing my browser now. So you can probably see, um, so this is the about page of Creative Commons. 
So just go to creativecommons.org. That's where our website is. That's where all of our resources sit. Um, if you want a quick overview, um, you're a little bit confused still by my explanation, go to the About page and you can read all about our vision and mission and what we do. Um, and then I would go to our licenses page, creativecommons.org slash licenses, and that gives a more in-depth description of each of our licenses and how they work. And this is where you would go to decide which license you would want to uh, choose for your own work. Um, but we also have a license chooser tool that actually makes it easy for you to play around with what you might want to um, choose for your own work. So here it is, creativecommons.org slash choose. And you can see it just asks you a couple questions. It says, do you want to allow adaptations of your work to be shared? Um, if you're okay, then click yes. If you're not okay with it, click no. And you can see on the right, it automatically changes the um, option for you. Um, so I'm going to say yes. Um, I'm going to choose a license that Wikipedia has on all of its um, pages. Wikipedia, um, the largest encyclopedia for the world that's crowdsourced is under a Creative Commons attribution share like license, which means that um, you are free to do anything you like with that work as long as if you translate it or remix it, you have to put it under the same exact license. And that's to ensure community contributions back to Wikipedia. So I'm going to answer here yes as long as others share like. Um, and Wikipedia does allow commercial uses, so you click yes. And you can see here that it says the selected license is attribution share like international. And down here it says have a web page. Um, copy this code to let your visitors know. So you can very easily copy and paste this into your blog or web page, and it will automatically display this license icon linked to the actual license. Um, and if you have a, an offline work, um, you can just select offline in the drop down here. Oops. It's a uh, computer's getting slow. And then it'll give you suggested text to copy and paste into your Word document. So you can go ahead and play with that license chooser tool. It's not a registration. We don't register any CC license works. It's just a tool for you to decide um, what license you would want to choose for your own works. Um, and then in addition to that, once um, if you want to find other Creative Commons license works to incorporate or to just to use in your classroom or to show your students or whatever report you're writing, you can go to search.creativecommons.org, which is our search portal to different search engines and uh, platforms that have enabled Creative Commons licensed uh, materials. So you can search directly on Flickr by going here. So let's say you want to search for a cat or a globe. Um, you would click on that. And it takes you directly to uh, Flickr's search results with CC licensed images of globes. So I already have an example ready for you. Um, this is a globe image that we uh, chose for one of our blog posts at Creative Commons. This uh, globe picture is under a Creative Commons attribution share like license. You can see that it, the license is linked in the lower right hand corner. We used it in this blog post here, Jessica Coates, and you can see the image here and we gave it attribution. This is the um, title of the image. This is the um, author, the Flickr user, and this is a license that the images under. Um, you don't have to go to our search tool to look for CC licensed content. You can go directly to the platforms themselves. You can go to flickr.com slash creative commons and browse by the millions of different CC licensed works. Flickr recently added two more CC license CC tool options. One is the public domain dedication tool I told you about which means that um, all of these works are in the public domain. Users have dedicated their works to the public domain using CC0. And the other is a public domain mark, which is very different from CC0. Public domain mark is merely used to mark works that are already in the public domain. So as Ken mentioned, works um, whose copyright has expired or that were created before 1923. But it's not to uh, mark your own works. You can also go straight to find videos at vimeo.com slash creativecommons. Um, Wikimedia Commons is another uh, platform dedicated to Commons resources. This is actually the repository that fuels all of the images you find on Wikipedia. If you want to find music, Free Music Archive is a really good resource for Creative Commons license and public domain music. And Internet Archive is another really great um, resource. This is the Internet Archive you probably know from the Wayback Machine. They have archived web pages from, I don't know, back in GeoCities days. Um, 
and they also have uh, lots of audio films um, and even software like the Oregon Trail um, from MS DOS days if you want to find um, historical digital materials. Um, and many of these are under CC licenses or in the public domain. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me for now. Jane, yes. I have a question Go ahead. for you. Sure. Um, if someone uses a Creative Commons license, are they able to limit the number of licensees or restrict the number of licensees, or is their work then licensed to the entire world? So Creative Commons license operates publicly, um, and it doesn't discriminate by user or set of users. So once you put a CC license on your work, you are publicly licensing it, licensing it to the entire world, regardless of where anyone lives. Um, so it's really a way for you to just publish it on the internet, on the World Wide Web. Anyone who comes across your work has um, the permissions to do uh, what they want with that work under the conditions of the license. So um, I see a question, uh, and the question is, when might you not want to use a Creative Commons license? So um, picking up on what Jane just said, you would not want to use a Creative Commons license when you want to control who the licensee is. So if, for example, you created a, a work of art, and you wanted to license it to a company to use, for example, as their logo, and you wanted them to pay you for that, you would not want to use a Creative Commons license because the Creative Commons license makes it available to the entire world. Is that right, Jane? Yeah, so that's one scenario where you wouldn't want to use a CC license. In terms of general scenarios, I, wanted, I do want to clarify one thing, is that Creative Commons licenses were designed for content that is not software code. So if you are wanting to license software under um, an open source license, there's an entire um, different open source software world out there, and they have their own set of licenses. So we do not recommend Creative Commons licenses for software code. Um, but otherwise, other things we do recommend, anything that can be copyrighted, otherwise um, CC licenses can be applied to. Great. Yeah, really good question. And we're having a conversation in the chat. Um, people are sort of talking about how, um, like on the flip side of like when, like I was thinking maybe we could even talk about why would you, like what's exciting about this, right? Just sort of unpacking and playing with that a little bit. And someone was saying the idea of using images that's just not clip art, you know, like actually there's like a world of images out there, right, that we can use in different ways. Um, and also think about our own content also as being more freely available if we so choose. Um, so as a Flickr user, I know for instance, I can choose all my photos and set a, a license to all of them, as Jane was saying. Um, like as the author of those photos, when I upload them, I think the default is is my copyright, and then I can change them in bulk if I want to, and just say, oh, or I can change just ones that I really want, like maybe all my family ones I don't want freely available, but like other ones I do, right? And I'll just like in bulk change a bunch of those. Yeah, so that's a really interesting thing, is um, a lot of platforms have enabled this default setting where you can actually sh change your default setting to sharing by default under a Creative Commons license. And that's, I think, indicative of how sort of the culture has changed since two, uh, since 2001, since Creative Commons was founded. I feel like the default in sharing in general, regardless of copyright, is just sort of sharing with the public. Yeah. Um, with tools like Twitter, Instagram, even Facebook, a lot of people don't really set their privacy at just with a certain group. A lot of people are aware of that and do set that, but a lot of people, especially teenagers these days, it's the default is public in sharing with your um, with celebrities and fans and there's just one-to-one -one connection and um, it's really interesting so the baseline for sharing has really changed since 2001 in 2015 I feel like the default is that you share with the public and then you kind of rein in oh I want to share these images maybe just with my family mm -hmm. and so if you think about it that way Creative Commons is even more relevant than ever before because since you're already sharing with the public you might as well specify what you want the public to do with your works um, and Creative Commons is a is really a very strong uh, symbol with legal backing that enables you to 
let the public know exactly what they what you want them to do with your work and what you don't want them to do with your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I wanted to go back to this. Um, well, there was a question, so let me just um, the and uh, can you? So a question came out: Can you revoke a CC license, and can you change your mind? So, Jane, do you want to take that one too? Yeah. So you yes, you can always change your mind. You can always change the Creative Commons license on a work, and you can always take the Creative Commons license off the work. The catch is that anyone who access that work under the CC license at the time that you put it on can continue to do so in perpetuity. So an example is, let's say I take an image of um, a national monument and I put it on Flickr under CC by today. Tomorrow I change my mind and I take off the CC license. Anyone who accessed my image today under CC by can continue to do so forevermore as long as they live. But anyone who accesses it from tomorrow onwards has to use it under the new terms that I have changed it to. So Creative Commons licenses are perpetual once you add them, but you can always change them so that any subsequent users have to use it under different terms. Right. Which to me brings up a really interesting um, piece around attribution. And so maybe I'm jumping a little bit here, but I wanted to actually talk about attribution too in this context. And Ken, you had mentioned attribution. Like there's this myth that like, well, if you say you got it from X or Y or Z, then um, it's fair. <laughs> like, all is fair in love and war or whatever. But, um, but in, um, C in CC licensing, the CC by like, kind of license is actually like very much saying, you can use this, but you have to attribute me. Like, it's really, it, it demands the attribution as part of the license. Um, while allowing it to be shareable. So I feel like the act of attribution is sort of like in a new place in our shared commons of the internet too. Um, although what Ken says is true, like if it doesn't have a CC license on it, you can't just attribute, right? So maybe we could talk about attribution just a little bit and then we'll go back to a couple of the questions that have come in. Sure, I did. Uh, did Ked want to take, say something first, or should I jump in? Or? Well, I mean, again, the issue of attribution does not um, vitiate a, a creator's um, rights to, to uh, a creator's ability to enforce their rights if they have not given permission, if they have not licensed the use of their creation. In fact, sometimes um, in advertising cases, for example, what you see is um, the creator of an advertisement giving credit to the creator of a work that they use in their advertisement, and that can lead to a false endorsement claim uh, because they're trying to uh, give legitimacy to the product or the idea that they're selling um, in a way that the, the creator of the work um, has not permitted. So um, again, you know, just because you say this work was created by so-and-so doesn't make it okay for you to use it if they have not um, issued a license for that use. So that brings up a really great point. Um, all Creative Commons licenses have a non-endorsement clause, which means you can't give credit or attribution to someone in a way um, that makes it seem like they're endorsing your work. Um, or your advertisement or whatever, however you're using their work. Um, and the, the licensor, the, the creator can always demand that they be, their attribution be taken down if um, they don't agree with how you've uh, used their work or how they have used your work. Um, so that's, those, the, the, these are the legal nuances that are built into the legal layer of the licenses that um, protect, again, protect the creator against, you know, making it seem like that you endorse something or something like that. Mm, that's really interesting. I'm glad that came up. Um, and it sort of relates to a question that came in about um, how do you pursue bad actors was the question. But I think it's a little bit about like how do you actually like protect that licensing no matter how you put it out there. How do you actually like, you know, um, it, and it I, I'm trying to avoid using the word police the licensing, but how do you like personally sort of make sure your license is being honored? Um, 
and I'm not sure. Jane, do you have thoughts on that, or is it? I mean, besides just yeah, noticing online. <laughs> yeah. So I always say this is um this is an issue that's not really unique to CC licenses, yeah. right? Yeah. Even without CC licenses, anything you put on the internet, like how would you police that? Um, yeah. If you put it on the all rights reserved copyright, people are still gonna, if it becomes popular enough, they're gonna use it. Um, you mix it, and there's no really possible way that you can. I mean, there are tools out there now that where you can try to search for things, but it's very arduous. Um, surprisingly, what we found is that if you CC license something, there's a community of users around your content usually, and that's when. Yeah, someone will usually alert you to misuses of your content if it's under a CC license just because there's a strong community around it. Whereas if you know there's no CC license on it, it's really just kind of in the wild and it's up to you to find um, those uses. Um, generally speaking, if you do put a CC license on something and someone misuses it and the community alerts you to it, usually those disputes can be resolved with a simple email or a tweet because oftentimes your, the reuser just didn't understand clearly uh, what it meant. Um, to reuse your work under X license. And when you just explain, um, this is what it says, they're usually, oh, sorry, and they immediately take it down or they um, correct their usage. Yeah. Well, one thing that this brings up to me and um, is that there's this power in the communities of practice, right? So a community that uses CC license has some power in its own ability to, like, police that licensing use, like, really sort of, you know, like notice when people aren't using it right and work to correct that. Um, and I was thinking about fair use also, and Ken, you brought up fair use in that sort of community space, because, um, you know, I know that, or what I believe is true is that communities like documentary fil filmmakers, for example, um, have developed certain standards of fair use within their community of practice. And I know that Renee Hobbs, um, who used to be a temple, um, at the Media Education Lab um, had developed some fair use guidelines for educators and it was really much about the community coming together as educators and describing for itself what are what did it feel like are fair use um, standards. What's interesting to me though is that when you know fair use in like classrooms meets the internet where, which is a learning space so I'm gonna move into education a little bit here you know where, where are the boundaries? Where do we, like, decide what's fair or not? So to me, Creative Commons has been a really um, powerful tool in sort of taking agency um, myself as a creator and then thinking with others about, like, okay, what are the learning tools we can use that people have shared freely online and what are the creative, what is, where is the Creative Commons and how can we use that commons, that community, as a place to access different resources and um, different tools. So I think, I mean, Creative Commons is not a substitute for fair use. Fair use exists independent of a Creative Commons license. Yes. Um, I don't know if maybe Jane has some, some thoughts about that. No, I just want to very much support Ken in that. And we, Creative Commons was, um, created to um, address a gap in the copyright system, but we were no way uh, created to replace fair use. We are strong proponents of fair use, um, otherwise known as exceptions and limitations to copyright in other parts of the world. You should you should very much so revi rely on fair use where you can. Um, Creative Commons licenses, they stop um, pretty much where fair use begins. Um, fair use overrules whatever the CC license. So if the Creative Commons license says no derivative works, but fair use allows derivative works, then you are very much free to use any work under the ND license um, according to fair use. Um, and we very much are proponents of that. Great. Okay. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. Because um, I, I do think that... Um, it's, I think what's interest, it's interesting, it's been interesting to be in a conversation about what do we even consider fair use um, as a community of practice, actually, um, and, and equally as powerful as thinking about if we were to license our own work, what would we do with it? You know, like, they, they, are, they are, I don't see them as mutually exclusive either, and so that's really great to understand better. Thank you. Um, Jane, may I go ask ahead, you a question 
question. Uh, yeah, I have a question about um, whether a licensee of a of, of a CC license submits themselves to any particular forum or jurisdiction for the resolution of any dispute that might arise under the CC license or, or if the CC license is silent to that because it relates to one of the questions we've uh, gotten in the chat role that I'd like to address. Yeah, so um, Creative Commons licenses um, are international and um, in the past we used to port them to each jurisdiction um, but currently we are uh, we are drafting kind of the, the most recent version of the licenses, version 4.0, is an international license aligned to international copyright laws, and they should be viable in every uh, sort of jurisdiction that aligns to those international copyright laws, like the Berne Convention. Um, but we also operate um, an affiliate network in over 75 countries, which means that the licenses have been translated and adapted to those laws. So depending on where you live, um, if... Um, you are, and depending on who licensed that work and where you access that that work, if it was licensed in the U.S., then jurisdiction would probably be U.S. Unless you live in a different jurisdiction, then it would probably be within your jurisdiction. And we have different licenses translated to different um, languages in different jurisdictions. So it would depend on you know what where the work is from, who licensed the work, and where that person licensed the work, etc. But uh, yeah, it would depend on a variety of factors. But basically. Our licenses are international, so the court, wherever, it would just depend on you know the parties involved and where that work was used and licensed. So the license itself doesn't specify a particular forum where the, where any dispute has to be resolved. Is that right? Um, generally, yeah, it doesn't. Well, each since each license is translated and. Um, I mean, for example, if in China someone licensed a work um, in China and another Chinese user used that work, that you know that forum would take place in China. Um, but if it'd be less clear if someone issued a work under uh, a license in the U.S. and a, a user in China used that work, where that where that court would take place if there was a dispute. Um, but there, Thank you. So, yeah. so that relates to a question um, in the the chat role that someone has asked, which is, do you forfeit any rights by using a CC license? And um, what I would say to that is, you don't forfeit any rights, but you have entered into a contract. When you are a licensor under a CC license, that is a contract, and you are agreeing to those terms under which you are making your work available. So uh, you, are, you are restricted to enforcing the rights that are under that contract. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if someone is using the work outside of the permissions that you have granted in the CC license, of course, you have all of the rights available to you that exist uh, under all applicable law. You don't lose anything. Right. Um, and the, the dif difference is that you're the contract is between you and the public, right? So any user who uses your work, and if they violate the license in any way, then they are automatically their rights are automatically revoked. Um, and with version 4.0, they have a 30-day window in which they can correct their use. Um, if they do so, then they their rights are reinstated under the contract between you and them. But um, but basically, it's a way to keep your copyright, but you are granting permissions to the public. But you're not forfeiting anything per se. That wouldn't be the correct term. Great, thank you. I was wondering. Um, we have about 12 minutes left, and I was thinking I'd really like to move into um, thinking about learning um, and teaching, since we're um, you know here with the Bartol Foundation, and they're working with teaching artists and. Um, I, you know, we have just spent 40 minutes kind of talking this through, and like, oh yeah, that's an interesting question. That's a, you know, and so thinking about this kind of discussion or discourse with people that we might be uh, learning with or teaching with, um, uh, you know, there's some tools that we can share. Um, but I was just thinking about um, how. I don't know how complex this can be for a teacher and a teaching artist. I'm wondering if anybody had um, anything they want to share about that. 
Um, I would say for if you're a teacher and educator, there's an entire world of open educational resources out there for you <laughs> to explore. Um, so depending on what subject area you're you're teaching and what kind of materials you need to support um, your teaching in the classroom or elsewhere, um, there are a variety of places you can go. So I pasted in a link to our education page, and that lists a few of the key sort of education platforms that have um, open educational resources like MIT Open Courseware, Connections. Um, and Connections, for example, is a community for educators and other education practitioners to go to to um, upload their own textbooks, lesson plans under the CC BY license and for you guys to share each other's works and build on them. Um, and so I think within the open educational resources movement, it's much more clear um, that everything should be open and free under a Creative Commons license because the aim is education and universal access to it. So it's uh, as long, so one thing that we do uh, work towards at Creative Commons is implementing open policies for educational resources that are funded by public institutions, funded by the government, because taxpayer dollars are going to it. We say it should be openly and freely available back to the taxpayer um, under the most liberal license so that anyone can do whatever they want with it. Um, and one kind of concrete example of that is um, the U.S. Department of Labor $2 billion community college grant program where um, they required any educational materials developed by community colleges under that program to be CC by license and all of that's going to be sitting on the repository called Skills Commons hosted by Merlot at the Cal State University um, and that will all be openly available to everyone. These are high industry sector resources um, in aviation, manufacturing, healthcare, engineering, stuff like that. Great. Um, I was thinking about even in my own um, teaching and learning, well, I would say that at the National Writing Project, we have put um, a license on um, uh, our Digital Is website, and um, this is a website where teachers self-publish work. Um, so we also are encouraging teachers to... Um, self-publish under Creative Commons licensing, and they have options within that, you know, to have a less restrictive or more restrictive license or all rights reserved within that. But we're definitely very conscious of um, uh, trying to support educators in sharing their work um, uh, and being able to develop and remix their work together. I mean, it's actually the way that educators often work, and so in these spaces, really being able to create um, uh, together when you publish online. Um, so the, um, and we also think that it's a, we also put it there because um, in thinking about supporting youth in being creators, and that's really um, ultimately the uh, shared goal that I started with. Um, and so in sort of being an educator and experiencing making your own choices about your licensing and about the use of your materials and what you create in the world, um, we've, we're have we trying to support conversations about how do you support learners being creators and making those kind of choices in the world too. So um, we also turn to a lot of resources that Jane just um, mentioned. And um, Jane, I hate to put this on the spot, is School of Open still open? Um. Yes, go up and it's still the resources are still there. Um, it's it's a little bit in a transition state in how um, the structure of the community and the initiative is, but um, that's actually a great transition. So one of the uh, resources in School of Open is this Creative Commons for Kids um, course that's online. I just pasted into the chat, and that was developed by our affiliates in South Africa, um, and they have used that with K twelve students uh, within South Africa, and it's pretty much relatable to kids anywhere. Um, another School of Open course that anyone, including kids, can take 30 minutes or less is called Get CC Savvy, Get Creative Commons Savvy. And that's just uh, easy four tasks that takes you through a couple videos um, and a few scenarios of you know how you would CC license something. And you can pretty much after 30 minutes, you can come away with a better understanding of how CC works. So School of Open is um, essentially right now it's a community of volunteers around the world. Um, within the CC community who are teaching about Creative Commons and open education within their regions. And um, right now we're migrating to for that to be more face-to-face -face programs rather than just online courses. Um, 
but we will keep our online resources available. So schoolofopen.org is where you can find a lot of this. Great, thanks. Um, I also wanted to share, I, I was thinking about a forum um, I think this is interesting just from a teaching and learning perspective is um, a forum like uh, Scratch which is being developed um, and has been developed at MIT where um, I, I don't know if you know this Jane but the if it's um, by default the the default has moved to a sharing default and 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 youth who are authors in um, Scratch can um, determine how their work is shared and then the, the work that's shared is remixable by other youth. So it's prompting a lot of really engaged discussion about, oh wait, I, did I want my work to be shared and why would I make it, why, like did I want to have my work remixed and um, so there's an interesting um, uh, project right now I know I heard about that's going on with the Berkman um, School of Law where they're also trying to think about resources for youth so that they understand how they can license and, and, and make decisions about the work they create so that um, and why they might want to make um, decisions like oh yeah someone else can remix my work which I think is actually you know sort of a complex thing to think through why would you want someone to remix your work in the first place um, can be itself just a really complex idea, although we see it more and more online, so it's also in some ways becoming more and more familiar. Um, so anyway, I, I think the scratch.mit.edu uh, is a site where you can see how the work in there is uh, created to be shareable and remixable. Yeah, and I pasted a link to their terms of service. Um, everything, all user-generated content, which means if you are using Scratch to create stuff, it's defaulted under the same license as Wikipedia, uh, Creative Commons Attribution Share alike. So, um, which means that's why everything's remixable, and they encourage remixed on that platform. Yeah, great. Um, and someone in the chat said um, that. An international exchange of these ideas is a really interesting concept too, and I think that um, that's really a space that that Creative Commons has been very active in, and um, I know Jane herself has been too. So we are at the end of our time. I want to just give a second for everybody to give sort of a last thought, um, and then we'll um, say good night for now. So. Um, I don't want to call anybody. I want to put you on the spot. So, any last thoughts? Good of the order comments before we sign off. Uh, my last thought would be, you know, as a creator, be uh, be mindful, be thoughtful, be very specific in the um, types of uses that you are comfortable allowing for your work, and find an appropriate uh, license. Uh, whether it's Creative Commons or something uh, more specific to a specific set of, of users that you would um, feel comfortable allowing to use your work. Uh, specificity is uh, really important to protect your own work. Um, and I would just say that I know we went over, we kind of got into the nitty, de nitty gritty details and a lot of the questions that came up. Um, but I want to repeat um, and reemphasize that Creative Commons is all about making sharing easier um, and to facilitate conversations and collaboration among creators and users um, and to turn users and in, consumers into creators and vice versa. So um, I think we always forget that you can simply, um, even if the CC license or some other terms that are on a work prohibit something, that doesn't mean that you can't reach out and ask for permission. And you, people are always surprised by what they find. Usually if someone puts something out under a CC license, no matter how restrictive that license, they did so because they want to share the work, so they're inviting a conversation. So I would say wherever Creative Commons can facilitate that conversation and collaboration, um, you should definitely go for contacting the creator, um, the user, etc., um, and just be more open to ways of working. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Jane. What a that's a great comment. We got a comment on the chat just says share, share, and share alike. Um, <laughs> and I think um, my final comment would be that um, on the Creative Commons website, there's some great videos, and I think that they're. Um, 
uh, I think they're fun videos, but also great videos about what does it mean to have a shared culture and to um, create within communities um, a shared practice. So I think those are really important um, in thinking about, you know, why, why would we think through this uh, so deeply in the first place? So thank you, everyone, um, for, uh, thank you, Jane, thank you, Ken, um, thank you, um, Beth and Michelle, behind the scenes here, um, and all the folks at Ed Innovator. Um, we will be posting this broadcast as an archive at the Bartol Foundation's website, along with links related that have been mentioned tonight and that were posted in the chat. So um, find out more about the Bartol series at bartol.org and about Ed Innovator at educatorinnovator.org. And um, keep abreast of upcoming webinars and other opportunities to discuss um, uh, what it means to be a teacher, learner, creator, community today. So thank you very much and have a good night.